don't <laughs> have any option but to manage. No, 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 no. I think that is those are this is one of those periods where you just have to follow what they say. Mm. Sometimes you don't even need to ask questions. Doctor says this. It's like following doctor's orders. You just go. You don't ask why. No. Let's talk about social protection in Uganda. Yes. A couple of people, uh, at least a cross section of the public, feels that maybe we are already covered by the National Social Security Fund. And others argue that it is quite exclusive. But by and large, how has Uganda fared in the realm of social protection? No, uh, thanks. I think for us to really appreciate social protection, we should be able to first understand what it is. Yeah. And here you're looking at um, policies and programs or interventions that are put in place by either the state, um, the public, the private sector, or both to ensure that to, to protect and prevent people from poverty and vulnerability. So right now what we are seeing is really more people becoming vulnerable because of the, for instance, the guidelines that have been put in place for, to spread to to stop the spread of the virus, I mean, quite understandably, because, well, we don't want to have a, a health emergency right now. But that has had an economic impact. We have uh, studies actually indicating about 49 million people are likely to fall into extreme poverty globally. And uh, 23 million of these are going to be in sub-Saharan Africa. Well, that is where we are. So. When you start looking at that, you start to wonder, okay, what do we have in place as a country to protect our population from falling into poverty and falling into extreme poverty that is being predicted? So for, to respond to your question, you ask, what, how have we been fared? Mm -hmm. And like you rightly stated, NSSF really covers about um, 800,000 people. That are, those are the active members of NSSF. Well, uh, to, to be more generous, you would say it covers about 1.9 million people because the others are really not active. Mm -hmm. Then you have the public service pension scheme, which is also part of social protection, and that is covering about, uh, you look at about 4,000 people. Then you go to um, the other schemes uh, that are run by different organizations. You have, uh, there is the Makere University pension scheme. Our parliament also has a pension scheme, but those really cover a few hundred people. And then there's also um, a scheme that runs in the informal sector, and that, uh, that is the Mazima pension scheme. And that one has about 1,000, less than 2,000 people. So if you look at that, and uh, our working population is really about 15 million people, simple calculation would show you have just about maybe 2 million, 2.5 million people that are covered under social protection. So where are the rest? That means that actually majority of our population is very, very vulnerable. Is very, and especially in times like this, so we're going to have more people falling into poverty, and especially the people who work in the informal sector, because those ones are really not protected at all. Like I've said, we just have Mazima Pension Scheme that does about less than 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. So we really are doing not well when it comes to social protection, and this is really a debate that has been going on. And um, the issue has really been, the coverage right now is really more um, biased towards the formal sector. Mm. But yet, our population, our working population is largely in the informal sector. So, which leaves most people vulnerable and shocks like this one, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, it is hitting people so bad because, well, you can no longer, because these people, like the president has been emphasizing, they live by hand to mouth. You earn, what you earn today is what you're going to live on for the next two days. So if you don't work for that day or the next two days, that means then you have nothing. Then what becomes uh, the leeway for such people? Now you really understand that the largest, <laughs> we are dealing with the large informal sector, yes. close to 66.4% yes. of the population. And now how are we going to be able to include these people within social protection or including them within the schemes that can help them yeah. if we can't trace them? Uh, you know, the thing is, uh, we can't say we cannot trace them because we have data that actually, I mean, how do we know that we actually have 40 million people plus in our population? I mean, we've had all, I mean, we have had the NERA registrations. We have, I mean, what is the role of these local, uh, cons local councils? I mean, so, I mean, the, all those structures actually, because the, the, 
assumption is that these structures serve a population. Yeah. So what, where is that population? So this is actually the time for these structures to show us where their people are. Yeah. And then, but then the key issue is, yeah, like you say, how do we trust them? And the challenge has been that, well, we actually have... Uh, a lot of these disaggregated interventions to track uh, our population. You have NERA here, but then that data, how, how far have we actually gone to take advantage of that okay, huge data that we have, that we made people line up for long queues to actually register. Because if I register, then I should see uh, the role as to, the reason as to why I actually registered. So I think such data should actually be coming, coming in handy right now for the government to respond to these populations. But then, like, you, you, you asked uh, how do we actually respond to these populations and I think the key issue right now is we may not be able to think about um, because it is an emergency, it is a situation that needs a, a instant response yeah? because people are already vulnerable, some people are already not having a meal. And yeah, like you already indicated, the government is already uh, distributing. But we already have issues with that. We already have issues of quality, procurement. We already had people that have been arrested because of... Uh, so it's a bit challenging going that path. Uh, a number of economists have been saying that uh, how I wish we could uh, use and uh, find cash, all right? cash delivered to people or cash actually wired to people yes. in uh, and they are preferring cash in uh, to relate to food relief what is your comment about this i think i actually do agree uh, to the whole issue of actually having cash transfers instead of food distributions food distribution is good yes but then the, when it comes to logistics it becomes very very challenging who gets who doesn't get unless you're going to actually say uh, everyone as long as you're in Kampala, you're going to get. So I think what countries are doing is, um, and if you look at what is happening in the social protection sphere globally right now, countries, uh, cash transfers are actually the most prominent response government have ta governments have, have, have taking, are taking on. Because you realize that with cash transfer, you're giving people power, yeah? You're not making them feel more vulnerable. Yeah, someone has money in their pockets and then they're able to make decisions on what they can actually buy. Uh, because we've also had issues that, well, you know, the bins are giving us, you need, uh, you need charcoal, Sorting you need... Everything. Yeah, so, I mean, the money you actually spend to prepare this. How about if they give me money, I could buy greens instead, which are easy to prepare. I could play around that. And then, but also with cash, you actually pushing this money back into your economy, yeah? So you have people who are able to actually go out in their communities and support these businesses, which would have otherwise be closing down because, well, if we don't have money to buy, then clearly, why, I mean, the shop next door cannot sell, and the next thing after the lockdown, they can no longer survive. So with money, you're pushing, as a, a, a government, you're pushing back money to the economy, so you're boosting your economy in some way because people have purchasing power. Okay. Yeah. So, but then if you restrict this to just the maize and beans, there's really just going to be a particular sector that is going to earn from all this. Okay. But um, cash transfers, really, because some people look at it as, um, yeah, you know, that is uh, handouts and all that. But the thing is, people are spending this money in that same economy. Yeah, they are spending this money in that same economy. So it still boosts the economy. So it's just money going around. So you're not, government is not throwing out money. And then the other thing would be, uh, I saw, I don't know how uh, legitimate these are or how true they are, but we were seeing uh, some of the, I think in one of the countries, sorry, the district up country, the food that was supplied there had been imported. So we're already giving money out. But just imagine if you had given people cash and they're able to spend this cash in their communities, in the economy. So you're still keeping your economy vibrant. Okay. So really some people have issue. also argued and say that maybe social protection uh, pr prioritization is a notion that moves together with the economic progress of a country. And little no wonder our countries uh, may be justified to be performing poorly in the realm of social protection. Yes. In uh, that juxtaposed with the big countries or the first world countries that are really developing at a very fast rate and then prioritizing uh, social protection. So should we say that social protection can be left as a luxury for the countries that are, you know, highly developed and ETC and 
Oh, what is your comment about this? Thanks, but the key issue here is when you talk about social protection, really, mm. we are talking about people. It is people-focused development. You're looking at empowering your population. Mm. You're looking at making sure that your population, your people are not left behind, mm. or you don't have a particular section of your population left behind as the country develops. And with social protection, you are empowering people to be able to participate in the economy. Yeah, so it has a human, it is actually a human right uh, as well. So it cannot be a reserve of a particular uh, population and not, and we cannot say that, well, that is not for us because if, it, if they're human rights, then everyone is entitled to it. So I think for, because right now, well, we can say there is no fiscal space to actually uh, respond to the challenges we are facing right now. There is no, but uh, the, if you have 59 billion shillings already out there, and so the issue is how do we make sure that the responses we are coming up with right now are able to enforce or are able to build a foundation for us to going forward. Because but then you, you, you also realize, I want you to just help me couple this with, with the budget allocations because now you realize that most, close to 30%, uh, 70% of the countries in sub-Saharan African countries, they have development budgets, all right? The ones that are injecting quite a lot of money in infrastructure, among others, which does not so seem to be the notion with social protection. How can we be able to tailor the needs of the people to the kinds of budgets that we allocate for our people? Yeah, and you know that that has been a very, very um, uh, prominent debate lately. The issue is, okay, we have development challenges. We also have, now you're talking about social protection. I mean, the thing is, strike a balance. You don't want to... Um, invest heavily in infrastructure for instance and then the people cannot effectively use this in infrastructure what was the point so the issue is strike a balance yeah if you have a trillion here then you also have a trillion there because you want your investment you have you you want your investment to actually be able to you want returns on the investment uh, but if your population is not going to be able to use this investment you're making then why, why are you actually going on for going on with that? So the thing is, strike a balance. Yes, we need the infrastructure, but also we need a population that is able to put this infrastructure in uh, to proper use, and that is where whereby social protection comes in. Because social protection, you're also looking at human capital development. Mm -hmm. That is social protection. You're looking at empowering your population so that in future you're not going because right now you know why, why we're actually having these challenges is because we have not prepared our people to. To be able to, we have not protected them from shocks like this. We have not protected them to be able to respond to shocks like this. So when a shock comes, they're pushed down. Yeah, because, well, there's nothing cushioning them. But if we had people that, for instance, have been saving, and a person who is going to be saving is that person who was empowered through the education system and got a decent job or someone who actually is working but in an informal sector but is they are there there's a system in place that enables this person to save yeah because the issue has been okay why don't you open up nssf to tap into the informal sector but you know that has been left to a voluntary kind of basis so well if you want but why do you want to live i mean i don't think public policy should work like that if you want to protect the population you don't want to leave it to chance i mean an option yeah, so people should actually, there should be systems put in place so that when people can, they're able to contribute to their own security for, for, for situations such as this. Because when they don't, that is why we're going to sit here and ask government, you know, what are you doing? The people are vulnerable. But you know, it's because, yes, there is a gap and we do not take, take advantage of an opportunity. People were just, I mean, they, if they want us to... to to save, they can save. If they don't want, they don't save. Well, the, the public sector has not really responded to the plight of the people that are advocating for social protection, all right? Has the private sector uh, been able to take up that space to advocate for what is rightfully demanded in the realm of social protection? Has it? No, uh, uh, okay, the other thing is um, I would want to make it very clear that actually when it comes to uh, political, political will, that has been quite strong, especially in, in the ninth and 10th parliament. And no wonder we have one of the most vibrant uh, forums at parliament. 
the Social Protection Forum because we have members of parliament who are very keen and very, very passionate about social protection because they understand that if they do not protect the population, if they, I mean, they're there for their constituencies. So they need to come up with strategies and um, interventions that actually protect these populations and um, ninth and tenth that is actually uh, during these terms that's when we have seen actually um, the national rollout of the senior citizens grant that is and um, especially with the leadership of um, the speaker right honorable uh, rebecca kadaga she's she's also the patron of our forum so she's been very 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 strong on social protection so now we have um, the national rollout of the senior citizens grant of course, that also has its challenges. I wanted to tell you that people it, are getting it, less than 40,000. Right, it has its challenges, but uh, yeah, we have people, we have uh, our older persons receiving 25,000 25, 25, a month to support them by uh, basics. Um, but uh, yeah, when it comes to the budgeting, we still have a, a shortfall yeah, of about 45.5 billion shillings for the next financial year. And especially now, it is very, very uh, important right now because the elderly are now more vulnerable. So I think Minister of Finance actually should be looking at ensuring that this money is provided so that we do not make our older persons more vulnerable than they are already. And then the other thing would be uh, we saw from the uh, circular that was sent out to uh, a different uh, when it comes to payments. The senior citizens grant was not also highlighted as one of the payments, uh, priority payments for this during this lockdown. But I mean, this this is now this is now like a pension, yeah, for the for the senior citizens, and it is so you cannot actually put it out of the priority uh, payments during, especially during this period when this money is desperately needed by the recipients. So, as a forum, what we've been actually saying is. Right now, we should actually be looking at increasing the amount, so from uh, to at least fifty thousand, from twenty-five thousand to at least fifty thousand. But also uh, looking at reducing the the age of eligibility because right now, for you to be eligible for this money, you're supposed to be eighty years plus. Yeah. So we would like that to be, and the promise, of course, was um, with time, as uh, more money is. Um, as we get more money, we shall have uh, this coming down to 65 years. Well, you, you realize that now we, we may advocate for the increase in the money. Maybe from the 25 they are getting, so we double it to mm -hmm. 50,000. But now you realize that it won't tell you with the prices in the economy. The prices are going through the roof. How do we then reconcile the two ends? You know, the thing is about uh, when it comes to cash transfers and these responses, mm -hmm. the issue is not to really uh, fill your pockets with money, mm -hmm. but to help you survive. So they're really f to push you, uh, to keep you afloat. So we are not asking for government to actually enable us to get, uh, I mean, be affording uh, meat every day. To be no, it is really f to keep you afloat. So that when situations, uh, when the, the circumstances change or normalize, then you are able to actually, uh, you, you're not, you're not uh, pushed back or you're not down under and really there's nothing that can be done. So these cash transfers are really meant to keep people afloat. Yeah, because I also think we really have to appreciate that. Yes, we are a poor country. We are a poor country and they may not be that much to really just uh, luxurious, luxuriously give out to people. So I, I think we should be able to appreciate the little that, that is coming through. But, all, but the thing is um, issues of coverage, because right now uh, the, the senior citizens grant is covering about 300,000 people. But if you look at the uh, older person's population, you have over 1.5 million people. So where, is, where are the rest? what is happening to the rest that are not being covered right now. So the issue now here really should be about coverage and at least there is and consistency. So if you've been giving people 25,000 a month and then all of a sudden they cannot receive this money, what happens? You're making them more vulnerable. 
Mm. Yeah. So I think what we should be looking at right now is how is government actually um, making, creating, putting systems in place to ensure that more people are, are, are covered, Include. are included. Include. Yeah. So that we have. I mean, these these programs should actually be more inclusive. Yes. So that you do not have people excluded. Right. Yes. So I think um, when we're talking about social protection. Right now, it may not, we may not be, we may not have much we can achieve in two months, yeah? But I think we've learned a lesson. This period has actually been a learning period for us to appreciate that we need to protect our population. We need to be able to um, come up with interventions. We need a comprehensive social protection system. Yeah, a system that ensures that people are protected throughout the life cycle. The children are protected, the youth are protected, and then the... the, the, the age. Yeah, so, I mean, people do not actually get to a point where they are vulnerable. Because right now, what we look at as the working age, the working population, if, you, if that paycheck is taken away, someone gets vulnerable the next day. So people are living um, on paycheck per paycheck. So if the paycheck is not there, then there's nothing. So how are you ensuring that that population actually is saving, there is social insurance in place, and you've actually um, encouraged or you've uh, made it more attractive for people to actually appreciate that so social insurance is very, very... Because some people actually, Let if you told them, if you actually gave employees an option that, you know what, to give you your NSSF money and then also um, uh, depositing it on your behalf, what would you go for? They I think majority will say give me that money because they have not yet appreciated the reason as to why they need this kind of social insurance. But also in situations like this when um, our social security is not responsive to challenges like this one, mm. it also makes it very unattractive. So someone will say why should I save anyway? But then that takes us, takes us back to the terms and conditions. Mm. When you are signing up, did you actually read the terms and conditions? I mean, the terms and conditions were uh, given the certain conditions, that is when you can actually access this money. But I mean, they're all, it's all a debate, yeah, because you can understand why people want this money. You can understand why these people want this money, because yet they are vulnerable. Let us talk about the National Health Insurance Scheme, which the president didn't give assent to on set. He said you must first revise it. What is your brief comment about this? I'm realizing that right now we have a lot of people that are sick but can't even access those minimum health services what is your brief comment about this you know uh, things when it comes to social insurance and that is uh, health insurance inclusive mm. it is really populations to appreciate that uh, for those that have they should be able to, to support those that do not have because what happens here is you actually pull resources you pull resources, and um, so when one needs when when one needs a service, then they are able to access this service, uh, better quality services. Because the thing is about health insurance is not everyone is going to to need that service at the same time, and that makes it more um, feasible because. Uh, the fact that we are all saving, but then we all do not need that money at the same time. So we have people actually getting uh, better services at a relatively lower cost. Mm -hmm. But, uh, well, because, and it goes back to appreciating some of these issues. Because uh, the people that have, have been complaining that, you know, well, uh, what do I get if they deduct my money? Because I think was for the very vulnerable, I think those ones will not be contributing. Um, so people are like, huh, why would I invest in my, put in my money, contribute my money, and then someone else is going. But it's all about social cohesion. The thing is, I think what we need to appreciate is uh, unequal societies actually are a threat to all of us. Unequal societies breed vices that even you who is thinking that you're better off, you actually become vulnerable. Because the thing is, if you have people out in the streets, yeah, if you have, I mean, why people are actually going to be breaking into your house is because they think you have and they do not have. But the thing is, if you make societies equal, well, they may not be perfectly equal, but at least people should be having something and then they will be able to appreciate each other. Yeah, so some of those values are really as a result of these basic things, supporting each other in situations like this. But you're going to be there with your high wall and 
an unequal society makes you vulnerable just like the rest of the others who are out on the streets. So I think as a population we need to appreciate that yes, if you're going to say that we are in this together, let us actually be seen to be in this together. Yeah, because we do not want to see situations whereby we have a very, very um, high levels of inequality and the other people are going to resort to looking, uh, looking for those that they think have so they can also be able to get something. Right. Yeah, so I think we should be able, uh, social protection is really also about appreciating that, you know, as a society, we can do this together. We can, um, we can develop together without leaving the rest of the population behind. Yeah, because the other thing also would be um, the high dependency levels. Because if people are not empowered, then even you, when you go, when you get something, you really have to take care of lots of others. And I mean, so it's you go up, but then there are so many Someone people that are pulling, pulling you, down. you down. Because these people as well have also been, in, have not been empowered to be able to provide for themselves, be able to um, take advantage of opportunities. Uh, going forward, Gloria, how can we be able how can or what should the government be able to do to look at these dynamics, know how each interplays with the other or interfaces with the other so that it can deliver the will of the people? Yeah, like, like, like I highlighted earlier, uh, this has really been a learning process and if we, do not, if, if, there is, if we don't pick anything from here, let us at least pick lessons. And one of the key lessons that we need to take uh, post-COVID-19 is that social protection is really, really very key. It is the only pathway that we can have equal societies, we can reduce inequalities. It is the only way that we will make sure that our populations are not vulnerable for times like this one, in case another shock, another uh, epidemic or pandemic arises. Or it could also be um, we've been having landslides and things like that. Because so if we government has to make sure that there are avenues in place for instance to make sure that when people can they're able to contribute to these schemes nssf need to make uh, the fund more attractive let people appreciate that you know what i need to actually uh save in some money for times for hard times when i retire or for times when i'm sick for times when i cannot work and uh, uh there have also been debates to to for for the country to reduce on the the weight that comes with the public pensions. Well, it is also a bit controversial, but then how about we make that contributory? So that, well, wh why, why is it that for the public servants, for which I already pay salaries, for them they are protected, and for me I'm not protected. And then also they still have to get a, a pension at the end of it all, which they have not contributed to. So uh, th there's been that argument that if we are to reduce that burden to the taxpayer, how about we make uh, the public pension schemes contributory so that people in the public service can contribute to their pension at the end of the day, just like uh, someone working in the private sector does. You put and then also your employer puts some money. So these public servants can be contributing as well as government also puts uh, a certain percentage to, of that to their, to their um at the end of the day. A quick one as we get to wrap up. What is your comment about liberalization of the entire pension sector? It has sparked off quite a lot of debate. What is your brief comment about the same? Yes, uh, you know, the, the, there are all these arguments for and against and uh, from uh, studies that have actually been uh, uh, done, there are countries that have taken the path of liberalization and it has crashed. There are also countries that have taken that path and it has worked. I think as a country it is important for us to look at our own um, I mean, it has to be context specific. That is basically what social protection is. You look at your kind of context and then come up with interventions that are specific to your own situation. Because sometimes just picking uh, uh, interventions from here and there, you, you, I mean, we are countries where we say we may have the same challenges, but sometimes actually the approach may not necessarily be the same. So I think. As a country, we need to look at our own kinds of challenges and then come up with an intervention that fits our own challenges. All right. Yes. To the policymakers in the wake of COVID-19, a brief one as we get to conclude this very discussion. What should the policymakers do right now that COVID-19 is here? Our people have not been socially protected in the best way. Well, of course, right now, mm. instant interventions, cash transfer is key. 
Yes, and of course there's been this whole debate of the 10 billion shillings that have gone to MPs. And I, I think what we should be looking at right now is how do we respond to human vulnerabilities. I think that should be the core focus. Health, health responding to the health and that has been really um, we can say as a country we've been performing quite well on that but then we cannot we cannot have um, a healthy population that is hungry yeah so and also if people do not have what to eat you're not going to tell them to wash hands you're not going to tell them to social distance if they are worried about what they can eat the next day so I think what the policymakers need to be looking at right now is what are those interventions that we should be um, adopting to be able to protect our population from the vulnerability and from the shock that is um, coronavirus pandemic. All right, thank you so much, Gloria. You're welcome. Well, right there you have it. Um, I saw the sacks of posho written on that word food or posho for the vulnerable poor. It sparked off only two things within my mind. I thought maybe it could be true because it is going to those people that cannot afford a living. But then on the other hand, it made me thinking that maybe it's not the right thing because these are not vulnerable poor people, but they are just people or Ugandans on a lockdown. And why is all this happening? It is happening just because we didn't invest quite a lot when it comes to social protection. When we have a society that does not have equal people, it means that none of us will sleep. It means that those that have the money or the rich will not sleep because the poor people are hungry. And how can we be able to use social protection as a safety gear in the face of all that? That is through actually ensuring that there are enough. All right, thank you so much, Hakim Wampamba, and uh, for, talk, for that interview. Well, you will notice that uh, certain people will be crying in this time, but others are going to be benefiting so much that, wow, it's very surprising. Some sections of the economy are actually booming more than ever, and uh, others are really going down. But one, one thing I can say is that there is always a chance, by the way, for any person to find a way to twist their business to be able to suit what the demand is at the moment. And so that is exactly what you heard from Gloria Kajube and Hakim there. And I wouldn't just want to repeat everything, but I just want to let you know that is one of the things that really has sparked my interest, making sure that somehow you'll be able to understand that this time will not exactly suit in the originality of your business. And maybe you might have to think twice about what you are trying to serve at the moment. Mm -hmm. You might be serving commodities when people need service. So will you switch? Will you not switch? It's now a question that goes back to the trader.